Hello. Welcome to Chapter 8 of The Fourth Wall. This chapter is part of Part 1 of the book and is a novel. In this chapter, the author sets up some plot devices needed for the rest of the novel. However, Ariel does address more about the importance of stories and how they relate to the grand narrative. Story as identity is reaffirmed. We hope you continue to enjoy. Please like, subscribe, and share. Chapter 8 Poltergeists Ariel flew us to a small western town and a small house. It was inhabited by a family of four, two adults and two young children. The house was, I suppose, about 2,000 square feet. It had white vinyl siding with a bit of green mold near the foundation. The lawn was neatly trimmed with a few pots of flowers neatly arranged by the doorstep. It had black and gray asphalt shingles. One of the windows in the front was a bay window, which I reckoned to be either the kitchen or living room. There were hedges underneath the windows and around to the right where the driveway edge was positioned. A dented blue Ford truck with the tailgate down sat on the driveway. By now the sun hung low in the sky and the remnants of its light reflected on the face of the house. She took me around to the back of the house and to my amazement, a small angelic band was battling an equal number of demons by the back of the house. The angels had flaming swords resembling Star Wars lightsabers to me. The demons also had weapons. The whole affair was rather dramatic, even cinematic. Sometimes they would fall against the house or the lawn furniture, and the objects would remain solid against their falls. Other times the warriors would fall through things. The demons were like dark shadows with no faces but awful screams. The angels were like those I had seen but more buff and armored. Ariel motioned me to look inside one of the windows. It was the kitchen. When an angel sent one of the shadows flying onto the side of the house, they slightly penetrated the wall like your stereotypical ghost. Drawers and cabinet doors would open in the kitchen, causing occupants in the home to jump in fear while watching TV in the living room. Sometimes the battle made bumping sounds, and sometimes it made no noise. The angels soon subdued the shadow demons, put them in chains, and took them away. Ariel said that the angels try to clean up if they can, but enough sometimes happens in these demonic strongholds to make us humans think it is haunted. There are no ghosts, she explained, just demonic battles or demons trying to mess with people's minds like they are accustomed to. Remember, she said, God doesn't let you hang around for long. He translates you to your place to await judgment. Demons love to deceive by taking various forms to bring fear or to deceive you into believing that no judgment awaits. They take on their obsession's likeness just as the guardians do. You cannot call up human spirits just demons. I followed up with an observation and question. I noticed that the angels and demons and even myself while here don't interact consistently with the appearances. Sometimes I saw them go through objects and other times be stopped by them. So what is that all about? It was one of those moments when you get to ask a question that only we who have passed into eternity get to discover. The world you live in is essentially more like thought than material, remember. The universe is information. When the spirit world interacts in God's story, we are like vague thoughts, somewhat in the story and somewhat not in the story. When we angels, for example, are in the complete flow of the story, God grants us full interaction, like when Gabriel and the Lord spoke to Abraham and Sarah, or when Elijah and Moses spoke to Jesus on the mountain. Think of it as being synchronized with the imagination. When you were in the grand story, you were one with it, so you could pick up objects, breathe in air, and live in it. But when translated, you are remembered spirit until you receive your new body. However, the run-of-the-mill experience for us is mixed synchronization. Unless ordained by God himself, we have limited direct interaction within the story, except for gravity, which is a byproduct of the canvas. The shoes I gave you, we call them God's peace. Without them, you would fall to the earth's center, where there is darkness, never-ending fire, and sulfur. You cannot go there because that is the holding place for the devil and his followers. Your home in Christ is with Christ. I could tell Ariel enjoyed teaching. However, she tended to leave a lot out in the explanation. 
It is because no human would believe it. I can see people laughing now. Ariel sat down on the back porch. There has been a spiritual battle since the beginning. You might remember in the scriptures that we were delayed getting a message to Daniel because the demon prince of Persia was fighting us until Michael came to help, she told me. Who was with you? I asked. Gabriel and Raphael, she replied. Gabriel did all the talking. She continued, When enabled by the Lord, we can battle with even humans. You may remember that only one angel was able to defeat the Assyrians. Jesus told his disciples that if he wanted, he could command us to come and attack the Romans. But that wasn't the plot. Not much was revealed to you because you humans tend to worship everything. You were made for a story, so the demons use that strength against you. We were made for a story? I asked. I thought you said we were stories. You are, she reaffirmed. But within the grand story, you were made to understand and relate to one another. This is done by story. You are a story within a story. You are writing a story now. Everything is story except for God, who is the artist. I told her, I see that. When I was a child, I loved stories. It was the first way I connected to my mom and dad. They would read me a story before bedtime. I remember they would read the Christmas story during the holiday. She shifted in her seat and leaned forward a bit. Then she pointed at my head and said, When you had your earthly brain appearance, it was wired for story. Storytelling has existed in all cultures over all time. Your scientists know that a good story releases dopamine. A good story is like brain candy, so to speak. A story helps you remember. It helps you relate. It helps you find deeper meaning. Good tours are typically your leaders, teachers, and guides in life. You have been telling stories as long as there have been humans. Stories make you human since they bring the memory of the past into continuity with the present and help you envision a future. More importantly, stories help you understand your maker. If it were not so, you would not need the scriptures. Yes, I enjoined. I remember what Raziel told me about why God has a story. Story is identity. Stories enable you to create, learn, and envision possibilities. Some of your greatest advances in knowledge of the story and the canvas have come from stories, or what you call thought experiments. Albert Einstein, to whom I whispered, created stories of accelerating elevators, lightning hitting trains, or chasing beams of light to develop his theories of relativity. Einstein used his imagination to create a story. God used his imagination to create the story. In this way, among others, you were created in God's image. If you understand the nature of a story, you understand nature itself, and you can find God in it. Paul wrote to you, The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. But you decided to live in your vain imagination and your own story. I was reminded by her words of one of Shakespeare's monologues from As You Like It. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. However, Shakespeare's use of merely players diminishes the story and us. It implies that being a story is somehow vacuous. We are merely players. Life is merely a stage play. The end is mere oblivion. This is the lie that the demons wanted to portray. Close the book, that demon said, and you are nothing. It is the opposite. We are God's masterpiece whose value is not in how we view ourselves, but in how the artist views us. We are art worth dying for. Ours is a story worth reading because we are subplots of the larger epic, an epic of the universe. Ariel took me to the parking lot outside of the church in Houston. We have a story to finish of our own, she said with another wink. Ariel took out another book and opened it. We get to see a rescue mission, she said.